welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our discussion of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. We've been talking about the presidents of the Gilded Age, and we now turn to a discussion of Benjamin Harrison, elected in 1888. In the election of 1888, the Republicans nominated Benjamin Harrison of Indiana. He campaigned aggressively and focused on the issue of the tariff which he insisted was important for protecting American industry. Cleveland, on the other hand, considered it beneath his dignity to campaign, while Harrison delivered hundreds of speeches. Harrison concentrated on the key states of New York and Indiana, which he won by narrow margins. Cleveland carried much of the rest of the nation and swept the South, winning the popular vote by more than 100,000. Still, he lost the electoral vote 233 to 168. In the ensuing years, Cleveland returned to the practice of law in New York City. He occasionally made speeches and maintained his old political contacts, but he didn't actively hold public office. Benjamin Harrison is one of those presidents that illustrates that having a range of desirable qualities does not necessarily make for a great president. Harrison was of the highest intellect, possessed high moral principles, and great skill as a public speaker. And yet, he failed to arouse great excitement around his presidency. Harrison was born in 1833 in Ohio to what was essentially American royalty by lineage. His great-grandfather had signed the Declaration of Independence. His grandfather was William Henry Harrison, the former president, and his father was a congressman. Harrison proceeded through a quality, if not Ivy League, education, graduating from Miami University in Ohio. He passed the bar and took up a law practice. He was a deeply religious man, teaching Sunday school, and was regarded as an exemplar of honesty and decency. As his family heritage suggests, Harrison moved readily into the realm of politics. He held a number of local offices before the Civil War, he volunteered for service during the war, eventually rising to Brigadier General. After the war, he returned to his law practice and a variety of political positions, the highest being the United States Senate, to which he was elected in 1881. As a senator, Harrison supported civil service reform, high tariffs, and veterans' benefits. As a senator from Indiana, he held a high position in an important state. This made him a potential presidential candidate. He was considered, but passed over, in 1884. In 1888, the Republican Party was awash in candidates, with nearly 20 men eyeing the nomination. From the field, Harrison emerged as a compromise choice. The factors contributing to his nomination included his unmarked record and impeccable reputation, his family lineage, his war record, and his popularity with veterans. Harrison conducted a vigorous but front, front porch campaign from his house. The central issue in the campaign was the tariff, with Harrison advocating high protective tariffs, which would benefit American commerce. Cleveland supported lower tariffs, which would presumably lower costs and benefit consumers. As such, Harrison tended to win friends in the business community, and his campaign was lavishly funded by many captains of industry. Business leaders hired speakers to deliver speeches on Harrison's behalf, printed literally tons of literature explaining Harrison's views, and canvassed the country with posters and flyers. By contrast, Cleveland refused to actively campaign, and he suffered for it on Election Day. As I already mentioned, Harrison won narrow victories in key states such as New York, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, which won him the electoral vote. Harrison began his presidency by advocating a high protective tariff, extension of black rights, and pensions for veterans, among many other issues. Harrison was extremely intelligent and thoughtful, and used his legalistic way of thinking to solve difficult problems. Still, he wasn't always approachable, 
as he often rebuked those of lesser intellect in abrupt fashion. He had little patience for those who didn't grasp things as quickly as he did, and that meant nearly everyone. He was called Grouchy by one associate. Others had different names, but in general he was cold and unapproachable. Harrison selected capable men for his cabinet officials. Typically, they were similar to himself. They also showed that Harrison was not always politically savvy. He didn't choose men who had assisted in his election. He didn't pander to the New York political machine. In short, there were many who expected favors and didn't receive them. His support within the party eroded quickly. Like Cleveland before him, who had struggled to satisfy Democrats clamoring for office, Harrison now met the same problem as a Republican. There were now many Democrats in office that might be removed and a Republican appointed to replace them. Harrison did sweep away many Democrats out of office and made hundreds of appointments, but still he was incapable of pleasing the many clamoring for favors. Harrison advocated civil service reform and attempted to appoint qualified individuals to most positions, rather than satisfying party needs. Several machine politicians did not have their desires met. Other senators didn't have their desires met. In the interest of continuing civil service reform, he appointed a civil service commission, a rising political star from New York, Theodore Roosevelt, to his first major national position. On the whole, though, Harrison could never arrive at a satisfactory compromise between the reformers and the party machine. Both sides were dissatisfied, and Harrison's support slipped. Harrison confronted a number of difficult issues as president. Like Cleveland, before and after him, he confronted the currency issue. By this time, the call from the countryside was for free silver, the free and unlimited coinage of silver. Harrison stopped short of supporting such a measure, though he did sign the Sherman Silver Purchase Act in 1890, which increased the coinage of silver, but with some limits. While this action exceeded that of Cleveland on the currency issue, it didn't satisfy Westerners or the growing populist party, and Harrison lost footing in those areas. On the tariff, Harrison firmly supported a high protective tariff. He acted on this agenda by signing the McKinley Tariff Law in 1890, which raised protective tariffs on many items. It also appealed to farmers by offering bonuses on some items that were not on the tariff list, like sugar. Another significant act passed during the Harrison administration was the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 which appeased labor, farmers, and populists. Harrison championed competition and disdained monopoly, and this act reflected those beliefs. Still, Harrison was not in a position to adequately enforce the law, as Congress failed to appropriate funds for investigating the trusts. Aggressive action in that regard would have to wait for future presidents. Harrison also campaigned in support of black rights. His record on civil rights is mixed, but nonetheless admirable for that time. In an age when the American people had tired of Reconstruction, when racism was prominent and Jim Crow at its peak, Harrison tried to offer some sense of equality for blacks. He supported what was called a force bill, which would have authorized federal troops to supervise all Southern elections. The bill passed the House, but failed to pass the Senate and thus was never enacted. Harrison did appoint many blacks to significant offices. One, N. Wright Cuny, was appointed collector of the Port of Galveston. Frederick Douglass, the aging abolitionist champion, was named resident minister. There were many others, and such efforts raised his image in the eyes of blacks around the country. As a congressman, he had been called the Soldier Senator for his efforts on behalf of veterans. He continued those efforts as president. He appointed four generals to cabinet positions and many other veterans to other positions. 
He made many speeches before veterans groups and celebrated passionately patriotic holidays. He also campaigned vigorously for veterans' benefits. In some cases, this support of veterans backfired. In one instance, he appointed a veteran named James Tanner as the Commissioner of Pensions for Veterans. Tanner, who had lost both legs at the Second Battle of Bull Run, was a great advocate of assistance for veterans, and he dispensed liberally aid to all manner of veterans. Critics of Tanner soon accused him of misusing his office and mishandling government funds. Eventually, the President ordered an investigation of his activities, and Tanner finally resigned to save what was left of his dignity. In 1890, Congress passed the Dependent and Disability Pension Act, which extended benefits to minors, widows, and dependent parents. It also allowed all veterans who served for more than 90 days and who were unable to perform manual labor to receive benefits, regardless of other circumstances. Under the old law, only those veterans with wounds or injury obtained in service were funded. Partly to meet the growing cost of veterans' benefits, expenses of Congress expanded dramatically under Harrison. It was dubbed the Billion Dollar Congress by critics, as the federal budget exceeded a billion dollars. The extravagances of congressional spending became one point of criticism leveled against the Harrison government. Others included the growing cost of living, attributed to the high tariff, and the struggles of Western farmers. In the midterm elections of 1890, the Republicans were crushed in the House and carried only a narrow majority in the Senate. With a split Congress, Harrison was not able to continue the brisk pace of legislation of his first two years and left him hoping for improvement in the next election in 1892. In the next lecture, we'll turn to that election of 1892 and the next president, the return of Grover Cleveland.